Welcome to a special episode of Port Update. I'm Mario Cordero, CEO of the Port of Long Beach. We are here on the eve of the goods movement industry's biggest annual event, the TPM Conference. We are very fortunate to be joined today by Peter Tershwell, Vice President of Maritime Trade and Supply Chain for the General Commerce by S&P Global. Despite his many last minute duties, Peter has agreed to spend some time with us discussing trends in our favorite industry. As you may know, Peter is responsible for content appearing in the general commerce publications, websites, events, and other products. He has been a reporter, West Coast Bureau Chief, Editor-in-Chief, and Publisher of the General Commerce in his 30-plus year career with the company beginning in 1992. And he is the founder and chair of the annual TPM conference right here in Long Beach. Welcome, Peter. Happy to be with you, Mario. Glad, glad to have you here in Long Beach. So let's talk about 2024. Uh, why don't you just give us a brief outlook in terms of what you see for the industry in 2024? Well, it's an interesting year, and it's going to play out in ways that people didn't think it would play out for most of last year. Mm -hmm. When we look at last year, it was a year of normalization, mm -hmm. normalizing rates, normalization of, of port congestion, normalization of things like carrier profits. And yet, and then in December, uh, the Houthi rebels started to attack container ships in the Red mm -hmm. Sea, and we had the beginning of this mass diversion of, of uh, vessel services around, around the south of Africa. Mm -hmm. And that's going to change the, uh, the industry. It's going to change how things play out this year uh, in a lot of different ways. You know, in the January edition of the JOC overview and outlook for 2024, uh, you referenced the fact that as it relates to rates, carrier profit, profits, and port congestion, we're like in a normalized state. However, you did raise the concern about schedule reliability. Could you expand a little bit on that? Sure. So w one of the phenomenon that we witnessed last year was exactly what you said. Last year was a year of normalization, like you said, of rates, of port congestion, of carrier profits, all reverting essentially to pre-COVID norms. But the one metric that did not normalize was port congestion, where, excuse me, was uh, reliability, schedule reliability. And you're talking from a global perspective, From right? a global perspective, and certainly in evidence in the main east-west trades. And why was that? And, and, and the reason is that, that as, of, as port congestion normalized, mm -hmm. you saw a lot of what had been formerly idled vessel capacity get poured back into the market. You saw the beginning of vessel deliveries from the surge in vessel ordering that occurred during COVID. And as a result, you really had the manifestation of a whole new round of overcapacity that the carriers are experiencing. Well, what is the carrier's response to overcapacity? It's to manage capacity mm -hmm. through alliances. And that means blank sailings. It means unscheduled port calls. It means mm -hmm. slow steaming. Ultimately, that means that reliability when it comes to scheduling is going to deteriorate. And that's exactly what we saw. Well, talking about uh, the supply chain, we have a couple of issues right now that we commence here in 2024, the disruption at the Panama Canal, the Red Sea, how do you see the impact to the global supply chain and specifically the Trans-Pacific trade? Well, interestingly, the Trans-Pacific trade is not directly affected by mm -hmm. the, uh, what's happening in the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it is affected because the freight rates have adjusted to much higher levels, at least the spot rates have, mm -hmm. directly as a result of what happened in the Red Sea. And if you listen to the ocean carriers and the way they are describing how this is going to play out, and you've heard this, Mario, in some, some of the recent carrier earnings calls and, and uh, uh, you know, financial disclosures, uh, the ocean carriers have been quite honest, actually, with the market in saying that the capacity that was suddenly abruptly removed from the market when the when the vessel services started to uh, divert around Africa, that that all that all that uh, loss of capacity is going to be replaced over the first half of this year, with the result that that the if if 
by the time mid-year comes around, if the services are for the most part still diverting, uh, you're gonna have uh, uh, supply and demand in more or less equilibrium. And so therefore the, the, the pricing impact at mm -hmm. least will be less. The supply chain impact is going to be still ongoing as long as those diversions are occurring. Because if you're running a, glo a global supply chain and all of a sudden your vessel services are taking anywhere from 10 days to two weeks to three weeks longer, mm -hmm. that's affecting everything from your working capital, it's mm -hmm. affecting your inventory, it's affecting your forecasting, it's affecting when you have to place orders, when you have to design products, and, and, you're, and how long it's gonna take ultimately for you to get goods to market. That is going to be an ongoing impact as long as the diversions around Africa are continuing. We touched a little bit, uh, Peter, about the geopolitical events that we're having. Uh, how, how do you see that for 2024 and the ongoing potential impacts on the global supply chain? Yeah, so Mary, I think that, that we're in a whole new era now, actually. Uh, we're, it, it used to be that when we experienced disruptions to the ocean container supply chain. It was, you know, Hanjin going bankrupt in, in 2016. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a, you know, a one-time uh, inventory restocking surge that we saw in 2010. It was a little bit of a, 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 a bump in volumes that you folks here at the Port of Long Beach saw uh, at the end of uh, 2018 when Trump had threatened tariffs mm -hmm. on, on Chinese goods. Those are minor. That's the minor league compared to the type of disruption that we're seeing now. Uh, COVID, uh, Panama Canal, uh, Red Sea, these, these reflect a, a very changed world that is having a direct impact on this industry. In that changed world, the major themes are uh, rapidly rising geopolitical tensions, uh, accelerating impact of, uh, of climate change. So, Peter, let me follow up. Uh, on, on a question on that subject. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we were, we were already seeing the China plus one policy or view of things by the shippers. How do you see that today? So, so, so I, I see it in two ways, Mario. There's short term, there is, uh, there is evidence that actually shippers are trying to bring their supply chains in line with uh, with, with a pre-COVID scenario. Mm -hmm. So um, at S&P Global, for example, we published a look forward journal uh, that was talking about resilience. And, one of, and the findings of that report were that uh, for the most part, uh, retailers, consumer products companies, manufacturers in the aggregate were bringing down inventory. They were using fewer suppliers. And so you take, you use more suppliers as a hedge against disruption. So they're reducing the number of suppliers back to say a pre-COVID period. And they were also winding down or, or, or dialing back on their technology investment, logistics technology. So, so all of that suggests that in the short term, uh, like the lessons from COVID were not learned. On a longer term basis, you're, you're absolutely seeing diversification in sourcing. We're mm -hmm. seeing it in Mexico. Mexico just replaced China as the largest source of imports into the U.S. last year. Uh, you're seeing huge growth in, in Vietnam. In, in, at the beginning of this year, uh, Mario, I visited uh, uh, the Cai Mep uh, port complex uh, near Ho Chi Minh City. And th that port complex has been growing at 8% CAGR uh, for ever since the financial crisis. And, and, the, the, and the marine terminals there fully expect that they're going to continue to grow at 8%, which is m a much higher rate of growth than what we see on, say, China container imports into the U.S. Well, as a follow-up to that subject, you mentioned Mexico. Is it now maybe China plus two? That is, you talk about Asia, China plus one. And, you know, the next question with regard to nearshoring, your view of that, but are we looking at China plus two, given the movement that you see in Mexico? So actually, Mario, I think you're seeing a China plus 10. Oh. Because the, 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 the diversification that we're seeing is a lot more complex than, than China and then Vietnam. You're, you're, seeing, 
you're seeing manufacturing pop up in, in Eastern Europe, in, in Northern Africa, in, 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 in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, a lot more, when we look at the growth rates of containerized imports, you're, you're beginning to see accelerated growth rates in, in, in India, uh, multiple places, multiple countries in Southeast Asia, as well as Mexico, as well as other areas like, like North Africa. And, and so the, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a much more complex scenario than it was when everything was coming from China and it was, there were, it was China, not China plus anything. Mm -hmm. Well, the whole question of uh, the movement of China plus whatever number it is, but it's interesting for us at the Port of Long Beach because we've talked about in the past of two emerging markets, you know, the African continent, Latin America. And now we're starting to see this movement, as you've referenced, in terms of how is that going to impact, maybe for the good, of trans-Pacific trade. Yeah, well, you know, the, the trans-Pacific certainly as a market is changing. I mean, it, it benefited enormously from the emergence of China. And, and as China emerged, the, the traditional sources of trans-Pacific trade, such as Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, all shrank as a percent of the volumes that were coming in. And now we're starting to see even further diversification. And so without a doubt, the, the, the TransPAC is, is changing and, and, the, and the, the, the crazy thing about it, uh, Mario, is that, is that a lot of this diversification in sourcing is, is happening for external reasons. It's, it's not being driven. It was being driven by business reasons to the extent that cost pressures in China for high labor intensive manufacturing were moving to places like Vietnam and elsewhere, like furniture, footwear, uh, you know, the type of manufacturing that can't be automated requires a very, very heavy human component. We were already seeing that type of diversification occurring, but, but geopolitical tensions is, in a way, an unnatural force. It's, so the, when you have relocation occurring, sourcing diversification, mm -hmm. review of supply chain strategy overall occurring, when actually China traditionally has delivered the quality, the price, the reliability, the infrastructure, the carrier services, literally every, the, the entire system, the suppliers located nearby, so components, the, the whole ecosystem in China from a, from a pure business standpoint, for many years functioned very, very well. And that's why you see that there's a lot of reluctance actually to move out of China and the reason why that is is because, because it was working so well. So why change something if it was working? Well, Peter, my last question. Uh, we can't talk about the industry and goods movement, supply chain, without touching the subject of decarbonization. Uh, how do you see that agenda progressing now, particularly with the international carriers? Well, we're, we're, we're seeing movement in the sense that Last year, the International Maritime Organization revised their greenhouse gas strategy. Prior to that point, they had committed to 50% reduction of CO2 emissions by the maritime industry by 2050. They revised that to say it's going to be 100% of 100% reduction, full elimination of carbon emissions by or around 2050 by the whole maritime industry. The next two years are going to witness the, or they hopefully will witness the, the creation of, of global regulation coming out of the IMO to implement that ambition, meaning fuel standards applied on carriers, carbon tax applied on the industry. And while it was easy, and it wasn't easy at all, but it was certainly achievable to get all of the IMO member states to collectively agree on this ambitious target. It's going to be more difficult to get them to agree on the actual regulations to implement that such that those targets are actually hit. Mm -hmm. And I think that the ocean carriers have a certain degree of concern about this mm -hmm. because 
in the freewheeling, highly competitive ocean carrier industry, it is not always easy for container lines to pass on added costs to customers. The market is going to determine largely what customers are paying. If there's overcapacity, it's going to drive rates down, and it's going to and it, and it makes it more difficult for carriers to recoup even individual costs like fuel costs. Mm -hmm. It's harder for them to, to do that in an in a, in a environment of overcapacity. So if the higher cost of decarbonization ends up being uh, absorbed by the ocean carriers rather than passing that along to customers, that's a real challenge for the industry mm -hmm. because the carriers simply cannot bear the cost of the three, four, five times of what the cost of zero carbon fuels currently is and is likely to be certainly much higher uh, than conventional fuels for many years to come. Well, as we move forward to the last six years of this decade, I suspect uh, the, carbon, the conversation on decarbonization is going to be escalating for the good. And I think we're going to see some milestones in terms of not only policy, but technology. Hopefully, uh, we're optimistic, but I think you're on point in terms of the challenges for sure. So with that, Peter, it's been a pleasure, in fact, an honor to have the founder of the TPM conference here this morning at the Port of Long Beach. Great. Thank you for having me, Mario. Well, thank you for tuning in to Port Update. And let's get ready for the most exciting TPM conference here in Long Beach. Thank you again.